You guys are consultants in the area and you cover a lot of acres and work with a lot of different farmers. Is there a particular way that you help the farmers get into using soil health building practices or ways that you advise them? I think the first thing we have to address is what is the goal? Um, every farmer, every farm has different goals and once we prioritize those goals then we can start helping build um, the practices that will, will get them from point A to point B. So the practices you're mostly using, are, there, are is it like no-till or are there other practices that can help you get to a specific goal? So I think there's a lot of practices that we can use and, and definitely reducing tillage is one of them, but you don't have to go no-till to accomplish some of these goals. And again, it depends on what your goal is, but cover crops can be part of it, increased crop rotation, a lot of these things help to manage these systems. I think one of the biggest challenges has been guys think they're going no-till when they're using cover crops or going to soil health and that's not the correct answer. The correct answer is you're doing something different. It's not I'm going to no-till tomorrow. Uh, they might be reducing tillage, they might be going to a different system, but they're not going strictly no-till unless that is the goal. If the goal is to reduce tillage and go no-till, then they will. I think it's about using all the tools in the toolbox. Um, tillage is one, using different crop rotations is one, and I don't want to handcuff any of my growers and say, no, you can't do this. Um, I want them, their farm to succeed, and, and if going no-till is the best way, using cover crops is the best way, let's try that approach. And the really important part is that it's customized to that farmer's goals and his situation, his, his equipment, what he wants to accomplish. So that's the important part. Each farmer has to decide what is it what they want to do, how do they want to get there, what tools fit into their operation, and that's how we come in to help them fit those tools. So what would be kind of the most common goal that you guys may come across for, for farmers that you work with? So in my area, up in Nelson County, uh, we are wet, uh, heavy soil. We do have lighter soils on the outsides of, of my area, but right now the main goal is, Mark, I want you to fix the salinity. Uh, why, are my, why are my field edges so white? And so right now we're trying to introduce rye, trying to use barley on some of these saline areas to, to try to mediate uh, some of the lost acres. We're losing acres to salinity, and that's our biggest challenge right now. And you've had a lot of success with barley in, in those areas, right? Yeah, and so, so there's, there's two ways to fix it. You raise different crops to address the salinity, or you start incorporating cover crops to address the salinity. And barley is one of those crops, mainly the only crop. The only, one of the main tools we can use is barley because that's what grows in those areas. And uh, so whether it's following a wheat crop or a barley crop, we're simply seeding barley, we're broadcasting barley, we're tilling it in with a cultivator or a coulter tool, and uh, that's our first way to address salinity, is try to re reduce tillage and incorporate uh, a, a barley species in there to make it grow. And Lee, you have a lot of guys dividing the field to manage salinity. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're managing those spots as an entirely different field. Um, and so we're doing the same thing, we're changing that crop, we're using the, the, the tools that we have that are available, and sometimes we actually take Mother Nature and use her to our advantage and have the weeds help us manage those salt spots because some of those are the only ones that will grow there. And then, but still managing that weed, controlling seed, uh, keeping it from getting out of control, and then doing it that way. Like Lee and, and Mark said, salinity is a big problem in Lamore and Dickey County, um, but along with that salinity, weed resistance is becoming a really big problem for us and our number one goal is is the salinity management but we're getting um, s secondary benefits for the weed resistance because that's where a lot of that starts is in those saline spots where nothing grows and it just kind of spreads throughout the whole field so using cover crops and, and, and things to, like that to our advantage is really helping with our weed resistant problems. Do you think that cover crops are I mean just another mode of action that people should be considering when, when looking at weed management in their fields? Absolutely. I think that's a, um, there's nothing really new coming down the pipelines. There's new mixes, there's um, new formulations of things, but using Mother Nature to our advantage is really going to be one of the main modes of actions that I'm going to use going forward. Okay, so what are some of the other goals that you may hear from farmers that you work with um, outside of salinity? So I, a lot of my growers are dealing with wind erosion problems. And so that's in a different set. You're still using the same tools, but you're using different parts of that system. So in, with wind erosion, a lot of times we're dealing with lighter soils, drier soils, that type of thing. So it's important for us to be cognizant of not using too much water. So we're picking different cover crops, we're picking different timings, we're picking um, different rates, and maybe even variable rating some of this stuff in order to address those concerns without overusing water in those situations. 
So I've heard you talk a lot about oats, barley, cereal rye being kind of the three main grasses that you'll use. Which situation do you guys use those different cover crops in? So again, it depends on the goal. And if the goal is erosion, there's, a, there's an answer for that. If the goal is salinity, there's an answer for that. And so uh, for me right now, the salinity one is barley. That is our main tool to addressing salinity. Uh, for wind erosion, it could be, it could be uh, using rye. Barley is a combination. could be using oats. It could be using spring wheat. Whatever's in the bin, whatever the cheapest tool is to use. And uh, to, to, to get on the field quickly, economically, and to not break the bank in trying to... Uh, to fix erosion as quickly and cheaply as possible. Yeah, and I think another concern is what time of year do you have the opportunity to manage these spots? So if we're talking at a later season um, where we can't get a whole lot done but we need to manage something for next spring, the rye fits really well into that. You can get into the field, see the rye, it's there next spring for you when you need it. Um, if you have some opportunity behind an early harvested crop like a field pea or a small grain, then maybe you can use that time then. And you don't want to have, so in these drier fields, you don't want to have a lot of cropping use in the next year. But you need the residue to help manage the wind. So we're using oats in those systems because it'll grow well in the fall. It'll put on a nice mat. It'll give us some residue. But then it's frost killed and not a problem for the next spring. And I think one other thing we need to consider, whatever our goal is, what's our current rotation? Um, the worst thing I think that could happen is, is our cover crop becoming a weed in that field. So... Um, for example, I don't know if I would put uh, rye in front of wheat because I can't control rye in front of wheat. Um, so we need to, to keep in mind what's our next crop and so we can choose the best cover crop for the upcoming season. One of our next goals is to, you can control two goals. You can uh, provide against erosion and, and help out with grazing. So you can have cover crops that will stop the soil from blowing and you can feed your cattle at the same time. So now we can incorporate some of the radish, the turnips, the other species of cover crops in with the barley and the rye and the oats uh, to, to complete both objectives. Yeah, and that's one of those things that you learn on the individual farms. You know, once you start getting familiar with the techniques and the skills it takes to address your, your main concern, you can add multiple layers. And that's how people are getting to these higher levels. But you really have to take it slow and practice, gain those skills. And then once you get that confidence of what you know you're going to work and how it works in your system, then you can add more to it. So I know like water management is another major goal. In the, in the valley, it's using up extra moisture. And in your areas, maybe it's it's using less moisture but getting good cover to reduce evaporation. So what are some of the things that you guys are recommending for, for moisture management when, when using these tools? Well, tile doesn't fix everything, and not everybody can tile. So you have to find plan B, C, and D to manage moisture. Traditionally, it's tillage. Uh, guys will use tillage to make their field drier, ready to get in there and plant. Uh, the next thing is cover crops, using rye, using other crop species to manage moisture, to use moisture, to conserve moisture. That's what we're trying to do, and we're learning. Uh, we're learning to use rye, to terminate rye, to let rye get a certain size, to control the moisture management. Yeah, I think, again, it comes into, you can definitely use different species, but then the timing is also the other part of it. If you can get a green growing plant over time longer in that system, you can manage your moisture in a longer system. Rye helps extend the growing season, but so do a lot of other cover crops. And we've been also using things, the deep-rooted, tap-rooted species like a, a radish or something like that that really goes down and gets to some deeper moisture quickly. And we talked about it before, do you guys have a preferred method if you're going to use cover crops for getting the cover crops on the ground? Is it, is it flying them on? Is it using a drill? What is, how do you guys, what's your preferred method? Whatever gives me the best seed to soil contact is what I prefer. So whether it's with a drill or using some sort of coulter system to incorporate, um, but whatever works for that farm. I have a lot of growers that will aerial seed and we've had some success. Um, however, in some drier parts of the country where we maybe don't get some, the rain that others do, it's maybe not as great, um, but whatever gives me the best seed to soil contact is the way I prefer, but depends on their equipment and, and what's already being practiced on the farm is, is kind of, it is the determining factor. For sure. We, we, you want to seed the crop. We all know that you place the seed in the soil, it's going to have a much better chance of growing. So I think we would, we would hedge on the bet that seeding it is going to be the best. The second way to do it is you're broadcasting. You want to give yourself enough time so that you can get a rainfall to help your crop grow. 
and then to be cognizant of which cover crops are going to respond better to different moisture situations. Some are going to deal well with, with heavy moisture, some are going to be better in low moisture. And with different seeding situations, so larger seed needs to be a little bit deeper, smaller seeds needs to be closer to the surface, so taking that into consideration on, on seeding depth as well. And timing, that's got to be a huge issue up in the northern part of the state for you, Mark. Yeah, we have lots of farms that want to get cover crops and want to use cover crops, but we're, at, we're addressing it too late in the season. And we get those phone calls in middle, late September, even early October, we've lost a window where we want that cover crop to be actually growing and using moisture and getting sunlight. Uh, in November, this year, for, this year for example, it's no November 1st or 2nd, the season was over. And so if you seeded something October 15th, no bang for the dollar. So we're trying to get right behind the combines. Uh, in August, early August, middle August, I want the drills to follow the combines as fast as they can. But it's not easy. So you have to find uh, the help, get the equipment lined up ahead of time so you can get in the field as soon as you can. So it sounds like a lot of these, a lot of using these soil health building practices, it requires a shift in, in your expectations. I mean, it, that seems like the biggest part of this whole thing is, is that if if you, have a, if you have a change in expectations of what you can get on that field, um, that that's really the, the ticket to making this successful. When, I, when we start with these growers on these soil health building tips, first question I ask is, you know, what's your goal? I end each conversation with manage your expectations. Every season brings something different. Um, what happened last year might not happen this year and vice versa. Um, so managing that expectation is a huge key in that conversation when you start down this path of, of building soil health and, and, and incorporating cover crops, reducing tillage, it's the managing of the expectations. Yeah, and then that also that experiential learning. This is the other important part. They have to take the time to learn how it works in their system and on their farm and how to make that fit. So it really, t you have to take your time and do small things. Once you get a success, continue with that. But every year you should be trying little other things to either add or change or try different directions and do it in a small, low risk scenario. And there are expectations that are quick, expectations that are take two or three or four years to develop. Uh, so the expectations have to be real. Uh, they can't be fake. I mean, you can go to a cover crop seminar and come home and have these very, very high expectations. But your growing season is very different from someone that's 200 miles south or 200 miles west or east. So the expectations have to be real, they have to be local, and, uh, and they have to be what they are. Do you guys have a go-to source where you get your information or is it mainly just working with your growers and seeing what works on their farms or how do you get the information you need to, to be able to make recommendations? We share with each other I think is one of the big things and I think that's one of the great things about agriculture is that farmers are willing to share and consultants are willing to share information. So I think most of my information comes from experience. There's also a wealth of information from some other web sources and some good research that's out there that gives us the tools to begin, but the actual practice has to come from the experience of doing it. And I've really appreciated the work that you guys have done with your farmers because I highlight a lot of it in the Soil Health Minute, but then also on the NDSU Soil Health webpage that, you know, those 70 videos that are posted there, a lot of those come from the farmers you work with. And so it's a great resource for, for guys to get quick information on, on how to get started and, and how to set those expectations. Well, we have to thank NDSU as well. Uh, NDSU has provided us a new leader in soil health. You know, we have the chemical experts, we have the fertility experts, and now we have a soil, soil health team at NDSU to provide us some direction, what we should be learning for. And uh, it's good comfort knowing there's other people to provide information to us. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I really appreciate all the time that you guys put in and, and your willingness to do interviews and, and be on video and, and be part of all these different things that we do to try to get information out there. And I can really see that, that even in the five years that I've known you guys, that that, that has changed very quickly. Our, not, our understanding of the system has changed. And I know that every day I go out, I learn something new, whether it's from a farmer or from you, and, and you just have to keep your eyes open and, and be willing to learn. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.